Well, let's let's start. Good morning. Thanks. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, today we have, I mean, Happy New Year to to everybody. This is the first, it's your, I guess, first weeks of classes, and it's our first event of the year. And unfortunately, we have to deal with this issue that surprises at, at the beginning of the year. No, so so. Today's seminar on challenges to democracy in Brazil and the implications for Lula's presidency. We all, I mean, follow closely the, the, the very polarized election in, in Brazil. And then we were surprised by the events uh, at the beginning of, of this year. And we have, I mean, two great experts uh, to discuss how did we get here? Uh, what are the implications of uh, January 8th for uh, Lula's presidency and for the medium term uh, and for Brazilian political system and, and the democratic system in Brazil. So our two speakers today are Monica De Vol, who has been a senior fellow at, at the Peterson Institute since January 2017. She has been, after doing a career in economics, having a PhD in economics, working at the IMF, going back to Brazil in academia, publishing many papers on uh, uh, political economy, economic policy in Brazil. I mean, she had the foresight of starting to study, I mean, she will correct me, but I mean, immunology, infectious diseases, et cetera. I think before the pandemic started, uh, but obviously since the pandemic, I mean, she has become a, a, one of the experts, at least in, in the Peterson Institute and around Washington in combining, I mean, economic policy and immunology, I think in a very effective way for economists to understand immunology. And I think for immunologists also to think about economic policy and policies in, in, in general. And she has been extremely involved in, in discussions in Brazil regarding, I mean, the, the, the polarization uh, process that has happened uh, there. And we're also lucky to have Matias Spector, who's a senior fellow at the Brazilian Center of International Relations. Uh, Matias is also an associate professor and founder of the School of International Relations at Fundación Getulio Vargas. Uh, he completed his PhD at Oxford University and has had uh, several visiting positions, for example, at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the Council of Foreign Relations, LSE, uh, Etc. He's spending the year at Princeton University uh, as a visiting fellow. He publishes uh, frequently uh, in the New York Times, Financial Times, Foreign Affairs. Uh, so, I mean, we couldn't have better speakers to help us understand what is going on, what has been going on in Brazil, what happened on January 8th, and what are the implications of, of this process for the future of Brazilian democracy. So, so with that, I mean, we will start with the first round of, of interventions by Monica and Matias, maybe going chronologically, you know, trying to understand what brought us to January 8th. I mean, what are the dimensions under which the Brazilian population is polarized? How this polarization process had actually evolved? What has been the role of, I mean, the economy, institutional factors, uh, other factors, and what has been the role of critical events in recent uh, in the recent history of, of Brazil, uh, and then maybe we we jump to a second round of interventions on how do you interpret the, the events, what were the intentions of of the actors, and what will be the implications for the Lula's presidency. Uh, both domestic and, and foreign policy, and maybe for, for the medium-term uh, policy of Brazil. So we start with the first round. Maybe we start with you, Monica, and then we, we go to Matias. Thank you, Alejandro. For me, it's a true pleasure to be here and to be here with Matias as well. Um, thank you to the Georgetown Americans Institute. I'm very happy to be at Georgetown because my immunology and microbiology studies were done here. So um, like you guys, I have a degree already, you guys will have soon, I have a degree from Georgetown University, of which I'm very proud. So um, having said that, let me try to do justice to your first question, um, but I will go back 20 years to do that, um, to the first, to the, to Lula's first term in office, which started in 2003. 
Um, and I'll give you a little bit of a economic institutional take, which I'm sure Matias is going to have, um, you know, a lot of things to add to. So let, let me sort of try to give you that broad picture. So in 2003, Lula came into office. As you all know, he had two um, mandates back to back. So he was in office for eight years. And it was a very special period in Brazil in a lot of ways. It was a very special period for emerging markets overall, as you all know, because it was a time of, you know, just extraordinary things happening. Um, the world economy was doing really well. This was having lots of positive effects on all emerging markets, but on Latin American countries in particular because of their commodity exporting profiles. And this broad sort of frame, broad sort of environment not only um, helped Lula consolidate what was difficult to consolidate at the time, because for those of you who have studied that period, you know that it was a very turbulent period in Brazil, the transition from um, Fernando Henrique Cardoso to Lula, not for political reasons. The political transition was actually quite smooth. The part that wasn't as smooth was the fact was the economy because there was a there was a crisis at the time. There had been a crisis about two years before, so the whole economic situation was extremely unstable. And when Lula came into power, he had to to make a lot of promises on the economic front, which he followed through on. And at the same time, he had a lot of campaign promises that he had to deliver. And this sort of global, very favorable environment helped him do that. Um, it wasn't the only factor. I mean, obviously, he had his own, you know, sort of competency to do that. But it was a very intense period of social transformation in Brazil, which I'm sure you've all studied. When I look back, um, one of the things that I like to reflect upon regarding that period specifically, and one piece of one one paper that I absolutely love because this is my economist of reference slash social scientist of reference is Albert Hirschman. And in 1973, Hirschman wrote a paper called The Changing Tolerance for Income Inequality, Inequality in the Course of Development. This was published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. And it was a paper that sort of tried to give a picture of what happens to the tolerance for income inequality, really to the tolerance for social mobility as countries develop and as countries grow. And that's the paper, if you look up on Google, the tunnel effect, that's the famous tunnel effect that became associated with Hirschman. It comes from that paper because he, use, he uses a tunnel, actually he uses you know, the, just a, a traffic jam within a tunnel to illustrate how social mobility works in its various aspects, not only in the economic aspect, but in the political aspect, in the sociological aspect. You know, it's a very sort of powerful metaphor to understand how different segments of society behave once you start down this process of social mobility happening in certain parts of, of society. And the, the metaphor is really useful to think about Brazil because in the way that you know, you portray social mobility. At the beginning, you have this sense that everything, nothing's moving. This is why the tunnel sort of traffic jam is really interesting. Nothing's moving. Everybody's really dissatisfied. Then something changes. You know, somebody new comes into power. They have a plan. They have something. You know, the global economy is helping. You can put in all the factors and all the ingredients that helped Lula at the time. And suddenly, you know, some lanes within the tunnel, they start moving because these plans go into effect. You start to see growth. You start to see development. You start to have some social mobility. And that sort of gives a sense of optimism to the country as a whole. So this, this kind of metaphor, I think, applies really well to Lula's first term in office, which, um, as you all know, ended with the Mensalon scandal, which was the first corruption scandal. At that point, and this is some, this is another point that you know Hirschman makes in his 1973 article. After you've advanced some with social mobility in the course of development, some portions of the population become dissatisfied, not because they're not 
seeing changes in their lives, but because they're seeing things happening to other segments of society moving faster than they're moving for them. You see, it's a very relative way of looking at, you know, what's happening to the various segments. So it has this social cultural kind of, you know, magnitude to it. And when you look at what happened in Brazil, that was indeed the case because you had the very poor and the poor moving very fast in terms of advances in social mobility. You also had the very rich moving very fast, which is kind of what the Men's Salon started to reveal. It became a lot more evident afterwards with the Lava Jato scandal and with, with, all, with what all of that revealed in terms of the construction companies and everything else that was involved. So you had you know, these lanes, the very rich lanes and the very poor lanes and the poor lanes moving relatively fast, while the middle classes were really kind of not exactly stuck because they did see benefits as well during this period, but in relative terms, they saw themselves as stuck. And that starts to generate resentment. So I think that's very helpful to kind of like understand this initial period and understand this feeling of resentment, which is really what builds the, the or lays the groundwork for everything else that is then going to multiply that feeling and feed you know, these, these elements of the extreme right and the ultra right in Brazil that became so resonant with this particular segment of the population and then leads us into, you know, January 8th. Um, so if you start from that point, you then move on through history and you start seeing the everything else that comes after that as a multiplying effect, because you enter the Dilma government and in the Dilma government, you get not only a deceleration in the global environment, which obviously affects everybody. And, you know, you start to see Brazil stall in terms of growth and there's no stallment still in, in the fall in unemployment, but, you know, people start to feel that the situation isn't as good anymore. This culminates in the protests in June 2013, which was a broad broad movement of dissatisfaction, kind of building on some of this resentment that had been planted early on, but it starts to stretch a little bit beyond that. That's That kind of characterizes June 13th, the, the, the June 2013 protests. The June 2013 demonstrations were not about removing anybody from power, nor were they about, you know, bringing down institutions or anything of that sort. They were very diffuse, but they were they kind of showed this dissatisfaction building, which speaks very much to this tunnel effect and to the whole social mobility story that Hirschman has, because the country really was stalling in terms of social mobility. Then right after that, the country gets hit with the Lava Jato scandal, which is a major multiplier of resentment. And, in, and it starts to, to, to sow indignation as well, which are very powerful sentiments, right? You start to sow all of these powerful sentiments simultaneously. You have people on social media where they get fed with these powerful sentiments as well. Um, the extreme right in Brazil at that point was starting to get organized. We can talk more about that later, but was starting to get organized and was starting to feed some of the narratives and some people were starting to buy some of these narratives. And so then that's where you start to see how the process really builds, right? And really becomes something big. And in that sense, it is very different from any comparison. When you look at this, this sort of historical perspective going back 20 years, you get a sense of how different it is in many respects from what happened here in the US. So we saw a lot of these comparisons of, you know, oh, January 8th and January 6th, and, you know, it's so similar. It's kind of the same phenomenon. And in many ways it is because the, the extreme right and the things that the extreme extreme right says in Brazil and the kinds of things that they defend and that they espouse are similar because there's a global component in the extreme right everywhere. But at the same time, there are some things which are very unique to Brazil and that have to do with these events. And so, you know, all of this leads to the consolidation of the extreme right in a figure, and that figure becomes Bolsonaro. He gets elected, and we can continue the story from there, but I'll now let you speak. And, um... Wow, that was a great <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do now. So let me try and build on what Monica said. Um, 
what's the puzzle for Brazil? Back in 2016, the Carnegie Endowment decided to run this massive study, 10 democracies around the world, uh, from Colombia to Turkey to Indonesia, to try and understand polarization. And the question was, now that Trump is coming to power in America, are we going to see rise in polarization around the globe? So we run the data. And then the question for the Brazil chapter, which I wrote was, why is there no polarization in Brazil? There should be lots of polarization in Brazil because there's massive racial inequality, social inequality, a north-south divide. The country's been run for 30 years by a coalition of the center-right and then a coalition of the center-left. So what's going on? Why no polarization? So we had to come up with a little theory as to why there was no polarization in Brazil in 2016. And the answer was, that we came up with at the time, there's an institutional design that prevents polarization from picking up. So unlike the United States, Brazil doesn't have a bipolar political system. It's a multi-party presidential system with open list proportional elections, which means no party runs on an actual port program. It's not programmatic politics. It's mostly clientelism. So that reduces the demand for polarization. We also looked at endemic corruption. When you have an entire political class that depends on illicit funds for financing their campaigns, there's very little incentive for actual clashes. And any Brazilian president, in order to govern, needs to put together a coalition because no party has a majority in Congress. The party that gets the largest number of seats, if lucky, gets around 25% of the seats. So that reduces polarization. That was the explanation. And then as we were finishing the chapter, Bolsonaro showed up in the polls. And then we said, okay, and this is how the chapter ends, will Bolsonaro break this? So that was the puzzle. Why did Bolsonaro break it? And now I want to build on Monica's excellent comments because she's spot on, I think. What happened in Brazil is that a system that was relatively inept at securing social equality, the economy had a pathetic performance since transition to democracy in 1985, much better than the past, of course. Income redistribution, of course. But remember, we're starting from a very low base and performing really poorly for a country that started charging, you know, taxation in Brazil, the day of transition to democracy was 18% of GDP, moving all the way up to 30% of GDP. So this is a country spending, but spending so poorly. So in that context, you have a massive corruption scandal. And what Lava Jato does, it's think of an equilibrium and it's an information external shock that breaks the equilibrium because what Lava Jato does in 2014 is show the voter how it is that governments form a majority. Lava Jato is opening the black box of governance in the country. And what it shows is that every president of Brazil, irrespective of political party, if they want to govern, they need to dispense cash, as every president does, pork and barrel in Congress, as every president does, but he needs to do something else. He needs to become himself the chief fundraiser for political campaigns of the parties that make up his coalition. And the way they do it is illegally under the table with overpriced contracts for public infrastructure work. That was the model across presidents. And the minute the voter in Brazil sees how the system operates, system stability, which was one of the wonderful things about Brazilian transition to democracy, stability breaks and people take to the streets, and there's the impeachment of a president under conditions that are very questionable. And there's this dramatic unintended consequence of Lava Jato, which is that all of a sudden, an actor that had been quiet for 20 years came back saying, well, we are a moderating force and that's the armed forces. And all of a sudden the political marketplace finds someone who's promising what the voter wants, someone who says, we're going to break it all. Bolsonaro ran on a message in 2018, which said, I didn't come to build, I came to destroy. We'll first destroy and then rebuild. And he carried the day. 
it's not zealots who voted Bolsonaro into office in 2018. He carried the day. He had differences in some places, 60% to 40% for the left-wing candidate. Even in the Northeast, which is the traditional hardcore poorer part of Brazil that voted Lula time and again, even then Bolsonaro carried all five leading capital cities in the Northeast. Because he managed to come up with an answer to a public that was angry and wanted to burn it all. So, you know, for people on the progressive side of politics, like Monica and I, we look at it and we go, oh my God, this is terrible, Bolsonaro is terrible. But at the same time, what did we expect? If you tell the voter how politics actually works and it doesn't deliver goods, what can you get other than anger? And that's what's so similar between Trump and Bolsonaro. What's very different, and I loved Monica's comment to the effect, you know, if you open the, the newspapers in Brazil, everyone does the comparison between the 8th of January and the 6th of January here, but it's so different because this has been a democracy for 350 years and institutions are solid and you don't worry about the military. Whereas in Brazil, it's a very different story. It's a political system that's discredited, that's broken, where the military are super powerful when they had a representative in Bolsonaro and the military, which are now very reluctant to support Lula. There was a big, Lula gave his first one-on-one -on -one interview with a big journalist yesterday. And in the interview, she says, well, Mr. President, you're gonna meet the commanders today, Friday. He's meeting them now. What are you gonna tell, what are you gonna say to the commanders? Which very clearly have been in cahoots with Bolsonaro and are part of the drama of January the 8th. And Lula's response was classic. He said, well, I'm gonna ask them what it is that they need because we need a national defense industry. So I want to understand what are the things they need to buy and make sure that they get what they need. That was the answer. And rightly so, because rightly so he's worried about the military because the military in Brazil, unlike it was the case in Chile, the ambassadors here, and like it was the case in Argentina or in Uruguay, Brazil did not get transitional justice. Brazil did not send the military back to their barracks properly. There was a 20 year interval in which the military stepped back, but now they are here once again. My concern is that although Lula's won, he's won by a very slim margin under 2%. And the economy, as Monica said, this time around is not the wonderful economy of the early 2000s when China booming, bringing commodity prices to the sky could lift Brazil as it did back then, allowing Lula to be everyone to everybody. Lula could dispense cash to the very poor, could do the very rich the very well. This time around, it's a much harder set of choices. So moving forward, I worry no end. Brazil's story is far more dramatic than the story uh, in the United States. And, and to add to um, what Matias was saying about the military, there is one really important component to understand how it was that we came, that we got to this place where the military once again are this force to reckon with. Um, when, you know, I remember having discussions even at the at the Wilson Center or the Inter-American Dialogue where, you know, both of us were were frequently there um, discussing these issues and Brazilian issues. I remember, you know, some seven, perhaps eight years ago uh, saying, no, 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 there's no there's no reason to be concerned about the military. The military understand that they have no role in politics. And, you know, there's there's just none of that. Um, there's no risk that that's that that's going to happen. And that was partly true eight years ago. But I think now we realize that, you know, that was perhaps too optimistic a reading. And there's one thing that makes that that has made the military over the years, you know, this this force that is once once more engaged in in Brazilian politics. And that has to do with the way by which they were deployed in cities um, during situations of extreme security problems. So one example is what happened in Rio 
for example, for, for instance, where the military were called in to intervene in, in the security of Rio because the situation was completely out of control in terms of the, the, the problems between, you know, the drug traffickers in the favela, especially in the big favelas of Rio, favela da Maré, favela do Alemão, and the, um, and the police, the clashes that were happening, and the fact that the police, even the military police, were not being able to control that situation. So the fact that the military have been called upon in so many instances, Rio being sort of the, perhaps the biggest, but in so many instances to deal with these issues and to thus present themselves as this moderating force has not been lost on people at large. And it is, you know, it, it is not by chance that people look at the military now and a lot of the people who hold this resentment and who hold this kind of indignation and who have been captured by the extreme right and what the extreme right has been saying. The extreme right, of course, puts the military right and center as the as the moderating power in Brazilian democracy. It's a it's a complete contradiction in terms, but there you have it. Um, it is not by chance that the population feels as if, yeah, that's right. That makes sense, you know, because after all, the military have been called upon on so many instances to bring law and order to, to the situation. So, Matias, I mean, to, to help us, and, and then we will open up to, to questions. We, we will do, I mean, a couple of, of, of rounds, but to understand January 8th, and we start with you and then we turn to Monica, I mean, was there a strategy? What was the strategy? Uh, different from January 6th, I mean, there was not, or at least for the casual observer, I mean, there was not a, an immediate action that they wanted to trigger, uh, but maybe there was. So it's, it's more a show of force to position themselves vis-a-vis -vis the Lula government. Uh, it's it was led by the military or it was the military followed. So why don't we go into a round in trying to understand exactly what was the objective of the uprising? Uh, who were the uh, thought leaders of, of this process? And we try to understand that. And then we finalize with a round of what are the implications of these so I think the, the story goes like this. Bolsonaro read from Trump's playbook from day one. So when Bolsonaro won the election in 2018, he said the election was actually stolen. I won it on the first round, not on the second. There's a problem with the electronic counting system. He said it as he won the election because he learned from Trump that if you want to proof your administration moving forward, one of the useful things to do is to preemptively deny the opposition the possibility of winning cleanly, right? So he cast a shadow over the legitimacy and the actual functioning of the electoral system. And he kept repeating it all the time. In 2020, when his approval rates went down because of COVID, he then said, well, we need to change the system. We can no longer have an electronic system. We need to have a paper ballot. And we need to have it before the next election. And if we don't change it in time, if Congress doesn't pass the bill I'm introducing to change it back to a paper ballot, then we won't have an election, he said in 2020. What that produced was a coalition of the entire political class, including parts of his base, against him. Because all these deputados and senadores, they get elected through that system. They didn't want to meddle with the system. So they united, and they united with the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court of Brazil had gained an awful lot of power as Dilma Rousseff fell through an impeachment that was questionable. Um, and the Supreme Court had become a, a major actor in Brazilian politics, operating politically. So the Supreme Court took the lead in pushing back against Bolsonaro. And all the way up to 20, early 2022, he said he was not sure there was going to be an election unless he got the paper ballot. 
as the results of the election uh, on the first round came out, this was really very dramatic because on the eve of the election, on the first round, everyone thought Lula was going to win by a margin. Eurasia Group had it at 5 to 10%. And the day went by and everyone was desperate. And it looked as if Bolsonaro might actually win. So the minute the results from the first round come out, Bolsonaro says, I won. And that was the drama that fed a group, a very small group of people, of Bolsonaro supporters, who took to the streets, not to protest. What they did was uh, wearing the national flag, colors they went to out, they went to the military barracks and they camped outside praying to god that the military would intervene it's very strange the motto is military intervention with bolsonaro um and the military did nothing to prevent didn't get them out uh police forces didn't get them out and bolsonaro refused to concede in the aftermath of the second round. He never called Lula. He never gave a public statement to say, um, we lost. Uh, he never thanked his voter, strangely enough. But what he did do was give a statement in which he said, well, I read time and again the four lines. The four lines is the clause in the constitution that says that the military in Brazil, the armed forces are responsible, A, for protecting Brazil against external threats, and B, for providing law and order, as Monica said. He said, I read it time and again to see if there was something we could do with the four lines. In other words, military intervention to prevent Lula from taking office. This was very dramatic because part of the military commanders refused to hand over to Lula. They refused to salute Lula. Um, and that's the context in which Bolsonaro uh, leaves Brazil for Florida in the aftermath of the second round, without having conceded. He intends to go to Mar-a-Lago initially, but Trump won't have him. So he stays in Florida somewhere else. Um, and he says nothing. And what we now know is that on January the 8th, uh, protesters, which had been marching to Brasilia for hours. So there was plenty of time for security forces to know what was going to happen. Uh, they congregate and they storm the three main um, public official buildings, and they destroy them. And strangely, the presidential guard, which is charged with, with protecting the presidential palace, and they respond to the military, they did not act uh, for hours. They would only intervene after the, the police force uh, stormed the building. So there is 1,200 people, I think, now under custody. Um, and we're going to have a long slog now. The question is, I think it's not so much the nitty gritty, it's what does this mean, right, for Brazilian politics? And what I think it means, I don't see any, a near term crisis coming. The military commanders know they cannot go for a coup. The, Bolsonaro's VP, who's himself a general, gave an interview and said it openly um, we cannot have a coup because the government of the United States wouldn't have it. And it's true. The United States, uh, the Biden administration, I think you agree, played a wonderful positive role, sending the right signals all the time, sending Jake Sullivan to Brasilia, sending the head of the FBI to Brasilia. The, Bra the American embassy in Brasilia published a number of letters in support of the, of the electronic uh, polling system, voting system. Um, and there you have it. So now Lula's coming to Washington on the 10th of of February, and this is going to be a big thing with Biden, of course, comparing the two Januaries, right? Uh, but I don't see an immediate, a near-term crisis. What I worry about, the significance of this, is A, Brazil is a house divided. Effective polarization is at a peak. Um, it's literally divided. Bolsonaro almost got half the vote. Um, in an economy, that is very frail. Lula's going to have a hard time um, producing the goods. And in that context, anything could be a flame. Uh, I think Lula knows full well he cannot go to war against the military. He's going to accommodate them. This creates a moral hazard because now the military know that if they threaten Lula, they get what they want. 
So they're going to escalate. So um, in sum, if you look at the VDEM data, VDEM is this um, data system that looks at quality of democracy around the world and compares countries. Brazil in 85 was very low on VDEM. Then he goes super high in 1998 with Cardozo and stays like that with Lula. And under Bolsonaro, Brazil plummets from 0.8 to 0.5. And it stays there. Will Lula be able to reverse this? I don't know. He's put together a phenomenal pro-democracy coalition. And that's remarkable. Will that coalition hold together when the difficult economic decisions need to be made? I don't know. With everything that Matia said, I want to add a few things, though, on um, on the on the Brazilian extreme right and how, you know, based on the previous comments that Matias was making in my presentation very early on, on how we need to understand this and how relevant, well organized and well financed they are. Um, because this is something that often escapes the narrative in Brazil. The narrative in Brazil has become one where, you know, January 8th was an attempted coup that failed. The institutions showed their strength when, you know, the day after Lula came together with representatives of the other two branches of, of the Republic, as well as the governors of every single state of Brazil. And they all marched through, you know, the broken buildings and, and you know, it was a whole, it was very symbolic and obviously all very powerful in a demonstration or an attempt at a demonstration that the, that institutions are solid. Um, and then the narrative that's playing out in Brazil is, look, this was tried, this failed, and it's a, it's a minority. These people are vandals and, you know, blah, 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 blah. The bigger question is, what about extremism? Because there's this interpretation in the, in the media and among some policy circles that, you know, yeah, extremism, but, you know, they're now, they now in custody. The 1,200 who are in custody, some others who have been already put in prison. And, you know, as Matias was saying, this is a slog. Investigations are ongoing. They're going after the financiers and all of that. Fine. However, there has been an extremist movement in Brazil that's just taken hold for many years. Um, you know, it's been decades in the making. And it involves certain important segments of Brazilian society. So it does involve agribusiness or a portion of agribusiness, I should say. It does involve a portion of the neo-Pentecostal evangelicals in Brazil. And it does involve security forces, broadly speaking. So not just, you know, the armed forces, the military, but also security forces more generally, police forces and, you know, all of that. So this is the boy bala biblia, you know, um, axis within within Congress, but it's present in society. This is this is really a, a view that's shared by people outside of politics as well, who are, you know, somehow connected to these sectors. Um, and, and the message that they have all come and put together is sort of like, on, it, it has an internal logic, okay? So yes, they're, they're, you know, if you look at January 8th and you look at those, camp, uh, those, those, camp, those encampments, you know, the, the people who are camped out in front, in front of the Brasilia army barracks, and you hear their interviews, and there have been a number of recent podcasts, which for those of you who speak Portuguese, there's one that's called O Assunto, and the reporter who who does the interviews is Natu Zanetti. It's the same reporter who has interviewed President Lula very recently, yesterday. And she has she has done one episode. It's episode 877 for anyone who's interested in, in listening to it. I've listened to it like 10 times already. Because it's an interview with two reporters who were infiltrated in the Brasilia camp and who thus had a chance to not only talk to people and see who they were, you know, and get a sense of what segments of society they represent, but also get a very, very um, important sense of the extent of the operation itself. I mean, this is a camp that had been run for more than three months. 
It had this whole infrastructure built, you know, with food being given for free to people for three months and not just, you know, a little bit of food here. No, if they had three meals a day, they had snacks, you know, they had, it was this huge operation. There's also for anyone who speaks Portuguese and has a chance to see it, there's a documentary that's been put together by Global. Um, it's in a channel called Global Play. You can actually get it on, on streaming. And it's called extremistas.br, so extremist.br. Um, they have six episodes so far. And it's fascinating because it does give you this very in-depth view. They've been doing it for a number of years. And it gives you this very in-depth view about the extreme right movement in, in Brazil. And it gives you precisely the narrative. So what's the narrative? On the economic front, the narrative is agribusiness is going to save Brazil. And remember, I went back 20 years in my initial remarks because it was precisely at the beginning of these 20 years, namely those first eight years that Lula was in office, that agribusiness became what it is today. It was because of the commodity cycle. It was because of loose credit policies that were given to this sector by public banks in Brazil. It was because of a number of other things that came together at that particular period that actually made agribusiness grow into the force that it is today and the sector that it is today. So that 20 year kind of arc is really important to understand the role that this sector is playing. Now, obviously, this sector has particular interests. Some of them are aligned with the extreme right. Some of them are not. The parts that are aligned with the extreme rights are those interests that have directly to do with expansion of the territory or, or the productive so-called territory into the Amazon. And this was something that Bolsonaro defended very clearly. He had a an environmental minister who actually was pro, you know, clearing the Amazon for production and exploiting the Amazon. Um, and this was not by chance. This is this is exactly what this portion of agribusiness wants. So there are now slogans everywhere, you know, which play out in the sort of extreme in the in the far right in Brazil. Uh, Agro is pop, o agro é pop, <laughs> you know, and things that try to bring to this agribusiness sector the idea that they're modern, they're not traditionalist, they're not, you know, associated with the um, ideas that we have about rural areas. No, it's all modern, it's all vibrant, it's all, you know, very, very, um, it is the, the segment of, of, of Brazil that is going to push the economy. And it is true that this has been the sector in Brazil that has that has pulled growth um, over the past few years because the rest of the economy hasn't been doing well at all. So the agribusiness folks are, you know, a, a crucial part of this movement. And you can see that if you have big money, as you do, behind these kinds of ideas and behind these kinds of movements, they're not going to go away. They're just going to transform. So what we call Bolsonarismo and what we say Bolsonarismo is, is a very small portion of this bigger environment of extremism that has now taken place and taken hold in Brazil. Then you bring the, the neo-Pentecostals in. Now, the neo-Pentecostals have massive capillarity throughout the country. So what some political parties used to have, like PMDB in the past, which used to dominate, it, it was always in power. Why? It was always in power because it, it had, you know, mayors in, in several cities and municipalities in Brazil. It had governors in several states. You know, they had this massive capillarity that allowed them to be in power all the time. That's gone. <laughs> and that went with Lava Jato because, as you all know, Lava Jato basically implicated the entire system, as uh, Matias was saying. Who now has that capillarity and then some? It's the neo-Pentecostal evangelicals. And they're not just in the rural areas. They're very much in the cities. And they're very much in the cities with an, an even sort of more fine, fine type of capillarity than political parties can have because they're in neighborhoods. 
you know, you have your neighborhood church. Um, and so they build these communities and the messages that circulate in these groups are the same extremist messages. We haven't talked about digital medias and we haven't talked about, you know, how um, digital medias have played a role in what we have seen in Brazil. But I will say this in terms of a major difference between the U.S. and Brazil when it comes to these extremist movements. I've, I've been reading on some of this stuff. This is why I'm talking about this. Um, Brazil, like other Latin American countries, is heavily reliant for anything on WhatsApp and Telegram, which are private social media platforms, which are very hard to monitor. They're very hard to keep track of, but that's where everything circulates. You know, everything that circulates amongst these extremist groups circulates via WhatsApp and circulates via Telegram, those two. They've had a massive role because not only do they allow these messages to circulate widely and broadly, but because they are very closed and they function, that they're not even bubbles. Calling them bubbles is, is not even the right expression. They're like, they're like interconnected sects. That's literally what they are. Think of a network of extremist sects. That's what's, that's what's in operation in Brazil. And there is a larger kind of intelligence behind this because there's an entire network, and this is out in the open. This is on YouTube. This is on you know, other social media platforms, but especially on YouTube and TikTok. You have these organizations which mediate the, 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 the passage from being a normal, you know, perhaps very resentful person towards radicalization and extremism. And th there's an ecosystem in Brazil that, that's been built around this and you have different players. So you have on the, um, at the very far end of the spectrum, you have those people who are actually out there radicalizing anyone who's, who belongs to these WhatsApp groups with content, you know, with me memes and, you know, fake news and whatever, because that's where people are getting their news from. They're completely, they've completely isolated themselves from everything else. How do you get them there? You get them there through these intermediaries. Who are these intermediaries? If anybody here is interested in researching extremism in Brazil, you have to look at something called Brasil Paralelo. Brasil Paralelo is a production company, as they call themselves. If you go into their website and their, and their YouTube, they look like Netflix. And the kinds of pr productions that they have, they make series, they have interviews, they make films. Everything is really highly produced. And they, they basically serve as this actor who is going to take people to the very edge of radicalization without radicalizing them. So it's a massive propaganda machine, which is extremely sophisticated. I mean, you really have to look at this to see what I'm talking about. And what they do is just play this role where they will pick up people. They have more than 3 million subscribers on YouTube and they have God knows how many on their website. And they take people, they basically ingrain them with these ideas that look, the history of Brazil that you've been told, it's all wrong. Let us tell you the real history. And then they deconstruct everything. And they have this big, they, they operate at, at a subliminal level where they're basically telling you without telling you that institutions in Brazil are irremediably corrupt. And that takes many people to the edge of radicalization from which they will choose whether or not they fall into the rabbit hole. And if they fall into the rabbit hole, there you go. You, you have the machine operating and the machine processing all of this. So then you get to the 8th of January. You know, that's how you get to a bunch of people camped out in front of army barracks, many of which were actually elderly people, which was surprising right? Um, in a lot of ways, you saw so many people there who, you know, were in their, in their 60s, in their 70s, you know, and a lot of people who, in, and this, this episode that I told you about, they, the two reporters, they talk about this, they say, look, there were so many people who were there alone, 
who basically had isolated themselves from their families and they found in those in those camping sites they found their community and that's what they say they say that explicitly that's what they found find online they brought that to real life as they built these camping sites around the country so it's huge <laughs> and it and it permeates every single institution that you can think of and therefore as for implications for lula you know the the space that lula actually has to move is tiny you know he's constrained from all sides because this kind of ideology i guess you'd call it now, i don't know if it's properly an ideology but it is everywhere and it surrounds him everywhere and it surrounds him in every single social class it's not restricted to these people those people this region that region no it's pretty much everywhere and it and it's installed in 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 every single institution so 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 maybe before we open it up to questions i mean you you've touched upon the role of many players in brazilian politics that have strengthened their position but also as traditional politics have let's let's say disappear that it's not the right word but in a way it was exposed by lava jato and but what happened uh, their means of influencing politics to achieve whatever objectives they're pursuing have changed and they're looking towards what is the space through which they can most effectively achieve their objectives and so so you touch upon the military you touch upon religious groups you touch upon the private sector so matthias just a, a little bit a view on how these players will position themselves in the future in brazilian politics can the center hold and then we open it up to questions the question can the center hold is the big question for the West everywhere, right? Is what the Brits, the French, the Italians, the Chileans are asking themselves now. Uh, I, I have no idea what the answer to that is. But I think what's so useful about what Monica just said is that extremism, which Brazil had seen none of under democracy, is now back in the game. And this is bound to influence members of parliament. Uh, across the board, and they're bound to influence governors across the board. And Brazil being a federal system in which the president, in order to govern, needs not only to form a majority in Congress without having the tools, now that Lava Jato's exposed how it works, without having the tool to form that majority, and in a country that is so divided and influenced by extremism in various forms, it's going to be tricky. Let me just focus on one institution what, that we didn't mention enough, I think, and that's the Supreme Court. I mentioned it before, but I just wanted to make the following argument. The Supreme Court has been crucial as a guardrail for Brazilian democracy. Had it not been for a very activist Supreme Court starting around 2016 in the proceedings for Dilma's impeachment, um, Brazilian democracy would have been in trouble. The judges have been extremely proactive in containing Bolsonaro, and they have united in containing Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro's managed to make two appointments, but in the next few months, Lula will make two appointments to the court because two of the justices are retiring. A lot of the political battles in Brazil have already happened through the courts for years, but now all the more the courts are critical. One of the big questions moving forward is, are the courts overreaching? The New York Times has a long piece three days ago saying, careful Brazil, the court is overreaching. It's not following due process. And in fact, there is an argument to be made, one can have the argument, but there is an argument to be made that in the electoral process, in the run up to the Lula election, the court did overstep and did a lot of things that you know, they're not in the books, they're beyond the books. So in the altar of protecting democracy, you have a court that's become extremely activist. Problem is, all of the people who voted Bolsonaro and who are convinced that the institutions are in cahoots with Lula, they're going to be convinced that the Supreme Court is dirty to the core 
If you remember January the 6th, when people break into the hill, people are singing, Nancy, where are you, Nancy? Nancy Pelosi is what the, who they wanted to get. In Brazil, they're singing the name of a Supreme Court justice. My concern is that if the court does overstep, that's going to break the, it's going to polarize the political system big time. And that's going to find echo in a population that is deeply mistrustful of institutions. And the minute the legitimacy of this court goes, one wonders which institutions have the legitimacy to contain these processes we're talking about. So I'll leave you with that. Not very optimistic today. To questions, I don't know. We we don't need a mic or anything for for the people on the streaming. So we'll give you a mic for for the questions and please tell us your name, which school are you affiliated with? And hello, my name is Igor. I'm a journalist at Folha de São Paulo and currently doing a sabbatical here at the Wilson Center. My chairs, you were just mentioning that Lula doesn't want to go to war against the military. However, he has been saying that he doesn't trust everyone in the military, has been firing people from his personal safety and replacing them um, with like personnel from the federal police. And just a few days ago, we learned that Braga Neto, who was the Brazil's equivalent of chief of staff during Bolsonaro's uh, term, and one of the main guys in the military, he was probably colluding with the former Minister of Justice, now in prison, uh, former uh, Secretary of uh, Public Safety in the Federal District, um, to impose a military intervention, not just say a military coup in Brazil. And I was wondering, what do you think would be the implications if Braga Neto or anyone in like the high command of the, uh, the military is implicated in one of these events, if they go in prison, if they are like persecuted by the Supreme Court, what do you think is gonna be uh, the consequences uh, for this? Great, Igor, great question. Um, I think you're right, I agree with you. Lula is gonna be extremely, let me put it this way. There's no doubt that a part of the armed forces not only sided with Bolsonaro, but is tacitly, if not explicitly, responsible for the events of the last few days. Whether that, what happens once that is clarified, I don't know. But knowing our Brazil, this is going to take a long time, right? It's going to be a real slog, two, three years, five years maybe, till we find out exactly what happened. My understanding is that Lula is going to play very carefully with the military because he knows that he antagonizes them. He knows that they are reluctant. And he also knows that although the top cadres of the military throughout the Bolsonaro years refused to go as far as Bolsonaro wanted to go. Remember, in one of the uh, national dates, September the 7th, Bolsonaro asked the commander of the Air Force to fly the jets so low in Brasilia that they would blow out the windows of the Supreme Court. And the commander of the Air Force said, Mr. President, I cannot do it. It's illegal. So the top cadres, you know, they played. I, I don't want to speak well of the military. Um, so you put me in a difficult position. But, you know, the top cadres, they they held the line. Far more difficult to hold the line with the lower cadres, which are far more pro Bolsonaro. And as Monica said, although a lot of the people in the camps are elderly, you go to any Bolsonaro rally and it's packed with young people. Uh, I, I think this is intergenerational, right? The, the, the deputy, the member of parliament who got the largest chunk of votes in this election in Brazil is a young YouTuber. He's not 30 yet. Um, and he um, he embodies the extremism, radicalism, fake newsism that Monica was talking about. Um, so long detour to get to your question. I think the big problem confronting Brazil now, and this is not a problem confronting Chile or Argentina or Uruguay or Mexico, is the role of the military. Civil military relations, which in the early 1990s 
was all the rage in political science in Brazil, but then disappeared, needs to come back. Because when we look at the history of the military in Brazil, there's only one period in which they left power properly, and that's 1998, 2016. Temer brought them back, and then Bolsonaro deepened it. Will Lula be able to push them back into the barracks? We'll see. Hello. Hi, uh, Monica. Hi, Matias. Uh, my name is Enzo. I'm a junior here in the SFS. Uh, in Brazil, it is very common, almost expected, that those who are caught and judged and put away uh, uh, by their crimes and mistakes can come back. Uh, so my question is, how do you make Bolsonaro answer for what he did uh, in a permanent way? And how do you go about structuring uh, a culture of accountability uh, that goes beyond uh, partisanship? <laughs> um, in terms of Bolsonaro, so Bolsonaro has, there are a lot of different investigations that have been, that are, at the, you know, um, happening or have been opened with the Supreme Court to uh, over the years, right? And now there are many more added on top of those, um, as, as you know. And the, I do think um, I don't know what my, uh, we'll see what Matias has to say about this, but I do think that there's just no way that Bolsonaro is going to be somehow, that, that somehow, you know, in the, in the typical way that Brazil used to function, we will find a type of jeitinho to sort of, oh yeah, but we, you know, oh, okay, we'll leave Bolsonaro out or we'll drag this out and, you know, we'll eventually leave him out. I, I don't think that's the climate in the country anymore. Um, and with so many, you know, <laughs> There's just so many things that he said over the years, which implicate him directly in everything that led to January 8th, that it is just impossible to imagine that you can sweep all of this under the rug and let him be, you know. So I think there will be a reckoning with, with Bolsonaro. Maybe it will be a reckoning that limits itself to not allowing him for to run for office again. Um, maybe it'll be a bigger reckoning. I doubt that part. Um, I think it'll probably end with him not being able to run for office again, and that will kind of be that. Um, so with respect to Bolsonaro, I do think that this will be seen through, you know, whatever whatever end this ultimately takes. As you know, Bolsonaro has been saying that he wants to stay in the U.S. and he wants to, you know, start a business of giving talks. Um <laughs> Yes, he wants to give talks, which is interesting because it makes you wonder, you know, what exactly is he going to talk about? But anyway, um, he does want to do that. And there are two problems here. I mean, one of them is the obvious. He's he still has his his um, diplomatic visa. He's going to lose that pretty soon. Um, and then he needs to actually have, you know, a work visa to stay in the U.S. and do what he intends to do. And. I do not think that that will be um, the course for diplomatic relations with Brazil. So you know, um, that isn't really going to happen. So he he is going to have to go back and he's going to have to face, you know, whatever is going to be dumped on him. People around him have jumped ship. I mean, he does have, you know, the, the support amongst, you know, there are people, actual people who support him. But the others, the ones that have been elected for, for Congress now, um, even his vice president, who's now a senator, Mourão, and, and also others who were part of his government before, they're just going to distance themselves, you know, so he's he he will be isolated. And I think he's going to have to face some consequences, whatever they might be. As for building accountability, <laughs> this is a much bigger problem because in a country where see, we're just this is the this is really the issue. We are just at the beginning of this process where and Matias may disagree, but this is how I view it, where Brazil might be turning politics on its head. So we need to watch, for example, 
this Congress that's been elected and that will take over in, in February and has a lot of Bolso former Bolsonarista figures as well as some other extreme right-leaning politicians, are they going to go back to business as usual and, you know, come together with the Centrón somehow and, you know, sort of do everything that used to be done in the same way that it used to be done in Brazil? Or are they going to use the power that they know they have because they know they have resonance amongst this large group within the Brazilian population that has become more extremist? And are they going to fundamentally dislocate, you know, the centers of gravity within the Brazilian Congress? That is a big question. We don't know the answer to that. And I think the answer to that will speak largely to the, you know, whatever kind of response we can give to your question, which in any case are all of them are kind of pessimistic in terms of in terms of where this end up, ends up. Because as I was starting to say, we are not at the end of a cycle of, you know, the rise of the extreme right in Brazil and blah, blah, blah. No. We are at the end of Bolsonarismo, which is this really tiny portion of the movement as a whole. We are just at the beginning of the rise of the extreme right in Brazil and how that's going to play out over the next several years. And so everything's open. Everything's kind of out in the open. And for any of you who study Brazil or who are interested in studying Brazil, this is a very, very fertile country to study right now, because you see, there are no historical references that you can really use to orient you and give you a sense of where things are going. You need to think from scratch. <laughs> you basically need to, you know, take the situation as it is, think about it deeply, identify the actors, know precisely what it is that they're doing, how they think, how they organize themselves, observe them, be kind of an anthropologist in a sense, you know, or use, you know, your social scientist lens more broadly than just, you know, one, um, one discipline in particular, and start forming new ideas about what this country is actually becoming, because history is not going to serve you very well. And I think that is an important message to leave with you guys. That makes it extremely exciting and extremely scary um, at the same time. I just want uh, to the question of what the future holds for Bolsonaro, right? I would be reluctant to declare that he is done because as you your question implies, Brazil has a long history of unaccountability first of all, but also because there is, the country is divided and there is no other leader of the opposition. There is no other national leader with a popular following in Brazil other than Lula and Bolsonaro. So structurally, these two are bound to clash. Now, it could be the case that Bolson, you know, the courts go through the motions, which are gonna take years to, prevent Bolsonaro from running in 2026. I think the odds of that happening are slim. And as of today, the obvious name to try and defeat Lula in 2026, or whoever Lula appoints, um, still is Bolsonaro. Things could change. Remember, we didn't see Bolsonaro coming in 2018, right? So things could change. But one of the dramas for the, for the, for the right and for the center right, that is not Bolsonarista, is who do you run a campaign with? And 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 there's nobody there, not now. <laughs> there are a couple though. Um, but I agree with you. No one has nobody has the nobody has the popularity that Bolsonaro has. So this would have, they would need to build themselves up. But there are two potentials, right? One of them is the current governor of Sao Paulo, Tassizio. And the other one is the current governor of Minas Gerais, Romeu Zema. So those are, those are two figures to watch. Question? We'll take one over there and then. 
Hi, Alex from the uh, Center for International Private Enterprise. Um, just a quick question. I was wondering if, obviously, uh, you mentioned, uh, Monica, that this all this resentment came from unemployment and the corruption scandals. Um, and obviously, Bolsonaro has not really resolved any of that or worsened in some cases. So do you see um, rhetoric as a solution or uh, to kind of appease this? Because um, obviously, uh, his popularity still remains high. So what do you see is the case of Brazil that this kind of rhetoric can kind of appease that and maintain kind of a status quo? Thank you. Um, and again, another another difficult one to address, because as it is, the economic problems that Brazil has are for the for the large for, for a large majority of the population, a very large majority of the population, they're blamed on the PT. So the anti-PT rhetoric, you know, the PT brought, brought brought all this on Brazil. The PT did this, the PT did that. Um, and I'm not absolving the PT in any way. I'm just saying that's that's the rhetoric as it goes, is still very much alive. And you can see that in the way that markets, for example, refer to anything that Lula says with regard to the economy. I mean, Lula has basically no room to say anything. If you look at this interview that Matias was referring to, he has he spoke for about, I don't know, maybe what, 15, 20 minutes, not even right on the economy. I, I can't remember, but it was very it was it was a one hour interview with perhaps, you know, 15 minutes, if that, of comments on the economy. And markets in Brazil went wild, you know, because he spoke of, he didn't even say that the central bank shouldn't be independent. He just he just questioned it, which is a legitimate question. I mean, you know, coming from a president who was just elect and everybody just elected and everybody was just jumping on, on all of this and saying, look, you know, this is absurd and this is and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and the and and then you you start seeing these people saying, oh, Lula, Lula three is going to be, you know, the, it's it's going to be just like Dilma and the economy is just going to go down the drain. <laughs> you know? And so that that sort of rhetoric and narrative is very much still alive in people's heads. And when you say, but look at what Bolsonaro did, look at the four years, you know, look at what happened. Look at the state in which the economy is in. People will say to you, there was a pandemic. Oh, but there was a pandemic, you know, and so you can't blame everything on Bolsonaro. There was a pandemic. And then you say, but he mishandled the pandemic. Oh, well, but, you know, everybody did. So that's so that's that's the problem. Um, you know, how do you actually change minds in that context? How do you actually convince people that the problems are real and it doesn't matter who created them? A lot of the problems have been there for a very long time and they really need to be, you know, sort of faced head on. Brazil has extreme poverty. It's like saying to people, hello, there is hunger in the country. Can we really accept that? Um, and, you know, there is a big there was a big increase in extreme poverty. Shouldn't that be the focus of of economic policy now? Um, inequality has has risen dramatically. Don't we have to do something about that? And the typical sort of response you get is, no, we need to be fiscally responsible. And then you say, well, but fiscal responsibility comes with social responsibility. Oh, yeah, but fiscal responsibility first, you know kind of argument. And then you say, but if you read the Constitution, you know, it is in the Constitution that actually um, giving, putting together social programs and, of course, in line with the fiscal framework, whatever that might be, but spending on social programs is a fundamental right as guaranteed by the Brazilian Constitution. Does that not mean something? And people will say, oh, the 1988 Constitution is too generous. It's too generous. You know, we, we just don't have the capacity to meet what the Constitution says we should do. And they disregard the Constitution. So that's the state we're in. <laughs> so then, you know, the, the question again is, how do you handle all of this? And how do you, you know, how do you deal with all of this? Um, 
which is why, again, it's a it's a huge laboratory for social science, Brazil. It's just, you know, everything you can think of is right there. You know, if you want to address constitutional law, there's something for you. If you want to talk about, you know, social programs, inequality, and look at that, there's something for you. If you want politics and extremism, there's something for you, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. And thank you, Monica and Matias, for this very upbeat analysis of uh, Brazil. Uh, lift my spirits. I was wondering if if both of you could address um, the question of the relationship of the, the analysis you've given uh, and, and the problems that Lula will confront in governing and so forth to what we can expect in foreign policy. You could, I see you, you could argue that he may it be so difficult to get anything done, as you describe it, that perhaps there may be more emphasis on foreign policy because the margin to do something is greater. And going to Washington or going to Beijing and all of that is, is you know, would make more sense. Or alternatively, you could argue that he's going to have so much problems that he really is going to have to focus and spend a lot more time at home, <laughs> work out the issues of the military and all these things that you've discussed very well, which would leave less attention on the foreign policy front. I'm just wondering if you could connect what you've said to what we might see in foreign policy. Maybe my guess. Okay, so oh, great. Um, Monica was saying that Lula is surrounded by constraints, and I think internationally the same applies, right? So the space for doing lots of stuff abroad is really very limited. There are four items, I think, that could you know potentially give him openings: the relationship with the United States, the relationship with the European Union, the relationship with China, and the relationship with South America. And on all four. So he's coming on the 10th of February, and the agenda here will be mostly, I'm sure, about January in both countries and the defense of democracy. And it's going to be a very good meeting with Biden on optics. But the nitty gritty of the relationship is not good at all because the trade relationship is nowhere. There's There's been no further progress after Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro made lots of progress in opening Brazilian trade on the nitty gritty, the everyday trade facilitation front. Um, military to military relations improved a lot under Bolsonaro. Brazil became um, a non-regional NATO ally, which means it can purchase cheap gear from the US military. And I think Lula is not going to touch that. That's something the military really want. Um, and the other issue in the bilateral relationship is China. And on the China front, Brazil is really quite relevant for the United States because Brazil in South America is one of the countries that under Bolsonaro, but before Bolsonaro as well, tried to an extent to resist a dramatic political dependency on China. Brazil and Lula, like all the other presidents in South America, will talk the talk of not taking sides, of autonomy, of not getting sucked into the rivalry, but that's virtually impossible, right? Argentina is in deep trouble now with China and being pushed by the United States like crazy. And this is the new normal. Brazil has been trying to avoid that. Whether Lula will be able to, I don't know. There are two currents shaping his foreign policy. On the one hand, Celso Amorim and the traditional foreign policy establishment, Itamarachi, who argued that Brazil needs to try and use the relationship with China to counterbalance the United States. And they will move in that direction. They're trying to, at least. And then there's interest groups who are very reluctant uh, to do that, who depend on the United States, uh, the military being the most powerful of them. So very little space on that front. The other issue now, the relationship with the European Union, the big item on the agenda is a free trade agreement between Mercosur and the European Union. And I think it's fairly clear now that Macron will not be able to deliver that agreement. So we're not going to see much progress. And Lula's been saying that he wants to review labor law, which means the chapter on labor, on labor would have to be renegotiated anyway. Lula has also said he is reluctant to go for accession in the OECD. So very little 
to do with the European Union other than unlock funds, mostly from Germany and Norway for Amazon protection, which has happened already. It's around $3 billion on the table for that purpose. Then the relationship with China, Lula's going to find a Xi Jinping that is much harder on him than Hu Jintao was, partly because China is in a different position, because China talks down to Brazil, uh, because China is very limited in what she can do within the BRICS. Can you imagine a meeting with the BRICS now with Putin? Not easy to deliver that meeting. So not easy for Lula, who's, by the way, been defending Putin on every occasion, long interview with the Time magazine before the election saying that Zelensky is to blame for the war as much as Putin. So very difficult for Lula in Europe on that front and uh, with China on that same front. And then there's South America. One could say, you know, optimistically say, well, now countries are aligning, they're moving to the left. There's Petro and Boric and Fernandez and Lula, maybe something there. And Biden now talking, you know, wanted to go to bed with Maduro again. Are we going to see something of that order? I very much doubt it. I don't think there's any appetite in the region for anything of that smacks of UNASUR. That would be the that would be the instinctual move by Lula, right, to reorganize the region and try to center it around Brazil. Then fifth theme, and with this I shut up. I promise. Um, climate change. On climate change, Lula's appointed a wonderful team to try and curb deforestation in the Amazon. But the foreign policy of it, I'm not entirely sure. He's saying that he wants to do two things. First of all, put together a coalition of South American countries that share the Amazon and use it and negotiate with Europe and the United States as a coalition of South American countries. You know, run for the mountains. Um, and the other coalition he wants to put together is between Brazil, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Indonesia to jointly negotiate um, concessions, money from Europe and the United States. Um, again. <laughs> um, it, the the only avenue that's really open is is as Matias was just saying right now the environmental avenue, and it's it's not by chance that you know you watch the events of Davos in the in the past week and you see the finance minister and the environmental minister together, you know, in a signal that, oh, all policies in Brazil, including macroeconomic policies, are somehow going to be centered around environmental issues in the hopes that, you know, this is something that will bring investment to Brazil and will, you know, um, give Brazil this sort of uh, presence in the international stage that it hasn't had. That's really the only foreign policy move that I can see them doing, and they've and they've are they are already doing it. In all other fronts, is as Matias said. I mean, this coalition of, of Amazonian countries, you know, which obviously includes Maduro's Venezuela, is okay. Great if they get together and they agree on something, but they can't deliver. I mean, we already know that, right? Um, every single country has problems, extreme problems um, within them with respect to, you know, controlling, controlling the whatever portion of the Amazon they happen to have, because it is a no man's land. Literally, we know that. Um, so what can they effectively deliver that would convince, you know, the European Union or, you know, other places, European Union, I think, in particular to, you know, engage diplomatically with these countries. It's it's just very hard to see. So one, thing, one, one policy tool that Lula did have in the early 2000s was the National Development Bank. He could give neighboring countries loans and he used that as a foreign policy instrument to build up Mercosur infrastructurally. That no longer exists. So very narrow uh, lane for him, I think. So we have time for a, a final question. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, well. Hopefully, I think we we set a very low bar. 
So hopefully we will be positively surprised in the next uh, couple of years. Yeah. Um, okay, I think that Alejandro, everybody knows me. I, I'm an international consultant, so I see more from development. Uh, I am Argentinian. <laughs> to see, leaving this um, um, very interesting uh, debate, uh, pessimistic, it's not um, what anybody wants. I think that your research could have confirmation now that Brazil may be consolidating a political system. I don't know if this Partido Liberal could become a sort of, because you say that uh, you don't know what was going to happen with all these elected people in, in, in Congress, but um, Argentina is going to change the government by the end of this year. And to um, us, Lula, uh, it's a, factor of moderation. We would expect that. And this is why everybody in Argentina from all uh, political parties and uh, um, business associations, everybody said defend democracy in Brazil. So I don't know if you, from your research, you say, well, we don't have polarization in Brazil. Now you have it. How you can consolidate the system you have now a new actor. Is this Liberal Party probably an embryo of something? Okay, great. So there's no doubt that Lula embodies the commitment to democracy in Brazil today. And the reason why he ran again for president for a third time after being in prison was because had he not done it, Brazil would go down the drain of autocratization under Bolsonaro, who is not only himself an autocratic personality, but also leads a movement that is not democratic. And in order to do that, Lula put together a very broad pro-democracy coalition. And in that sense, the accolades Lula gets in Argentina are due. Thank goodness there is a political leader with a popular following that can push back against autocratization. That's not been the case in many parts of the world. Poland and Hungary are just two examples, right? The problem is that keeping a democracy alive is not to do with the personality of the leaders only. It's to do with institutions. And as we were saying, the rebellion against the establishment in Brazil comes from a cause that one needs to attend to. And it's the fact that Brazil, as a political system, delivers poor services to the voter. So it's no wonder in a country where half the population is poor, where there's no accountability, it has the largest number of firearm crimes in the world. More people die of fire weapons in Brazil every year than in Syria. It is no wonder that the people rebel. The minute they learn how it is that the political system works, and what's, what I find, what worries me, the reason why I'm pessimistic, is that in all this conversation, there's no talk about changing the political system so it becomes a bit more accountable. In Brazil, if you're a politician, you can get away with crime and you will not pay for it. Not in the justice system, but not through the electoral system either. So what are the prospects for a democracy of this size if it doesn't improve the quality of the stuff it gives the people. So one shouldn't be so surprised, right? All of that said, wonderful that Lula is doing it, but he's 77 and um, Brazil's political system has gone a, a kick in the back and it, it needs to get its act together because otherwise it's not guaranteed that the third wave of democracy is gonna remain. Remember, the thing about waves is that they go and they come, they recede. And as we've seen elsewhere in Latin America, um, one should worry, I think, and fix political systems. I agree. And I will add one element to this. Um, when, we, when we speak of Lava Jato, we have to remember always 
that the danger with Lava Jato always was that it was going to destroy the standard political system that used to be in place in Brazil and not put anything back in place. Um, and what we saw happen, especially with the with after Lava Jato was completely discredited because of politicization of the operation itself, was that political parties, the traditional political parties, um, were, I and large, destroyed. Um, PMDB was somewhat destroyed. PSDB imploded completely um, to the point where what remains is unrecognizable as a political party. The PT hasn't exactly imploded, but it is weak. It is a much weaker party. And in, in the place of these three parties, we now have players like Peli and, and, you know, and other parties of the Centro who have, you know, risen and become and become more relevant um, within Congress. None of them represent renovation. So back to Matias's point, none of them represent, you know, what the country actually needs, which is political reform, political renovation, having, you know, young people who want to run for office and who want to occupy positions, you know, in, in Congress. It all goes against that, actually. What's, what's happened and what we've seen happen all goes against that. And to make a very bad parallel, I think it's a very bad parallel, but nonetheless, it's useful. You know, we saw what happened with Manu Politi in, in Italy and how that imploded the political system and what came out of that. It is not exactly the, the story in Brazil at all, but there, there, are, there are things that are reminiscent of that. You know, there are elements here and there that are, are reminiscent of that. So, you know, when I said that to me, we are at the beginning of a, of a kind of reorganization of Brazilian politics as we know it, and it's not necessarily going to take us to a good place. Um, that, that, that's what I meant. You know, I mean, we we are seeing a shift. There are lots of shifts that are that are that are currently happening, and having Lula as the guarantor of democracy with this front that he has been able to build, which you know is weak because it's formed by a lot of politi political adversaries, some of which have presidential aspirations in 2026. You know, is this isn't strong enough? To, to give us the kind of hope that, okay, at ultimately and at the end of the day, democracy will prevail. We, we just can't say that at this point. But it's much better than the alternative. Oh, yeah. So with that, I think the, st the stakes for this Lula administration, I mean, were very clearly laid out uh, by both of you. And I think we will be calling upon you frequently uh, to continue to help us in understanding uh, how Brazil is evolving either towards some of the equilibriums that you described that are pretty dreadful, or basically if Lula is able to, to hold this coalition, to enlarge it by pulling some of the people that uh, didn't support him in this election, but basically see uh, the value in supporting Brazilian institutions and democracy, and then uh, we will see, I mean, a new political equilibrium uh, developing that is much healthier than the one we had before. No, but I think you laid out, I, I mean, the huge risks that Brazil will be facing and, and that uh, President Lula will have to navigate in the next four years. So thank you very much. And thank you.